Hello everyone, it's Guy here. The goodness of God. He just over overdoes it. He says, he, whatever you ask, think, or imagine, he does more. I'm hearing this great testimony of this lady who has hep C for, I think, 40 years, and then cancer, or $87,000 bill, and a touch of God, and no hep C, no cancer, and no bill. It reminds us of this account in the Bible of the woman with the issue of blood for 18 years, and how she had spent all of her money with the doctors, and she wasn't getting any better, and it was just getting worse. And she hears the, of Jesus coming through, and she says, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And she sneaks up, touches him, and power leaves Jesus, and she's completely healed. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And then Jesus commends her and calls her daughter. Your faith has made you well. For those who have been following us, we've spoken about this account several times, because it is an account that reminds us that healing is God's will for us. This woman never asked, is it God's will to heal me? Uh, oh God, please heal me. She just presumed. She's very audacious in this, in this uh, case. Just believed and grabbed hold of a miracle. And Jesus commended her. If this was error, she should have been corrected. But no, instead she was commended. So let it be an encouragement to all of us that we can be like this woman with the issue of blood or the lady with this long-term sickness and how God just steps in and takes it away. I've got some really exciting scriptures for you. So uh, please take the scriptural references down and then when you have some chance later, you look it up and read it and let God speak to you directly. I'd like to draw your attention to Numbers 622, uh, Numbers in the Old Testament 622. This is a prayer that God teaches the priests to pray over the people. It's important because this is God telling the priests, this is how I want to bless the people. I want you to pray over them in this way. This is not the people saying, oh God, Please do this, do that. It is God teaching us what he wants for us. So here it is, number 622. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So you can see in this prayer, it's all the Lord doing. The Lord bless. The Lord make his face. The Lord be gracious and the Lord lift up his countenance on you. What is the part for man? It is to receive, hear these blessings, hear the heart of God to them and receive. I'm gonna show you an, an amazing insight here. Just this one revelation alone from God can obliterate many, many sicknesses just there. Just listen to this carefully. The last sentence says, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Hebrew, the word peace is shalom. If you go to Israel, meet anyone and say shalom, He'll say shalom. If you look up any dictionary, shalom is a very powerful word. It's not just peace. Here it is. Uh, I took it from the lexicon. It says here, shalom means completeness, wholeness, safety, soundness in our bodies, prosperity, welfare, health, tranquility, contentment, quietness, peace, even in relationships. So it's an all-encompassing peace that I think the best word is probably completeness. We're sound and complete, lacking nothing. That is shalom. And this is the shalom that God wants to give us, which is why he asked his priests to pray this over the people and says, the Lord lift up his countenance or turn his face towards you and give you shalom. So say shalom, shalom, shalom. Is it any wonder that if we turn to Isaiah 9, 6, this is a prophecy in Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah. It says this, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, Sar, Prince, Shalom. Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He gives us this great Shalom, this completeness, wholeness, welfare, contentment, health. So if we're stricken with sickness and down on our backs, we do not have shalom. God wants to give us shalom. So we bounce up just like that woman that was uh, ill for 40 years, bounced up, even without the huge medical debt. Amazing. In the New Testament, in John 14, 27, please write this down and please read this. It's just awesome beyond words. This is Jesus. He speaks these words very close to his betrayal and his crucifixion. He says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give this to you. Let your heart not be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Because peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. Now, Jesus spoke Hebrew, right? Or, or Aramaic with his disciples. He would have said, Shalom, I leave with you. But 
that itself is not enough. My shalom I leave with you. Jesus is giving us his shalom. This is Jesus. This is shalom. I mean, Jesus was never sick. He could walk on water. He could multiply fish and bread. He could tell Peter where to pull the coin out of the fish's mouth. This is the shalom that Jesus had. And he's giving us not just shalom, which is be, which will by itself be the most amazing thing, but not enough because of his great love. He wants to give us his shalom. My shalom I give you. So it's now that we know what shalom means. It's completeness, wholeness, health, soundness, welfare. What Jesus is doing is nothing more than fulfilling what was prayer that God taught the priest to pray over the people in Numbers 6.22, which we read earlier. There's a fulfillment of Isaiah 9.6, that Jesus will be born and he will be called the Prince of Shalom. It's a wonderful word. I encourage you, just say shalom to one another, shalom to yourself, and look it up and, and see the, the meaning of this word and the intention that God has to give us Shalom. In the New Testament, in 3 John 1 2, John, the Apostle John, who is now very advanced in age, writes this. And here, this verse is as follows Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So, this is the desire of God for us, as written by John. And he calls us firstly beloved. We're beloved of the Father. And we're so loved that he wants us to prosper and be in health just as our soul prospers. The word health is hugiano, and it means in good working order, healthy, in sound condition, in balance. The word balance is very important. We have to be balanced. So if some part of our body is unbalanced, maybe it's a chemical imbalance, or maybe a sleep imbalance, or even a physical imbalance, we're not complete. But God wants to put us into perfect balance. The key here is the balance starts inside first. You see, it says, I desire, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health externally, even as your soul internally prospers. So the soul must prosper internally first. The inner person must first prosper. And then the outside person manifests what's happening on the inside. So the question is, how do we prosper internally? The answer is given by God. It says, it is by hearing. Galatians 3, 5. Therefore, God who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? It means doing, doing, doing. Or does he do it by the hearing of faith? So when we hear and believe, it changes our inside. We start to prosper on the inside. Things we thought about God that are wrong, change. Things we think about ourselves, change. Our change of our mind. Uh, actually, it's repentance in Greek. Repentance means change of mind. We repent of things we are thinking about and change our mind to a new way of thinking, which is based on the gospel. And as we change our mind, that is accompanied with a change in our physical bodies. In Galatians 3, 6, so we read 3, 5 just now, 3, 6, it says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So this is explaining what hearing of faith means. It means believing God. What did Abraham believe? Did he believe that, oh, we have to do these 10 things, the 10 the laws, that have to do this or that? Well, the law was given many years after Abraham, so that, that's ruled out. This is what Abraham believed. It took place in Genesis 15. Abraham was seeking to have a son and because he and his wife had no children, he said, I'll have no heir. But God said, Come, Abraham, look at the stars. Can you count them? So shall your descendants be. And Abraham said, I believe. And God took note of that and said, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That is what hearing of faith is. So when we hear about the goodness of God that he gives, he gave to Abraham without conditions. He didn't say, Abraham, if you do the following things, if you feed so many people. No, he just gave it because God is a good God. When we have this hearing our faith about the goodness of God, it changes our perspective. And we think, gosh, all things are possible. I can be healed too. I qualify. I'm no different. I'm sick. I believe in a good God. I believe God can touch me. And that is what hearing our faith is. It changes our inside and we changes the outside. In Romans 10, 16, it says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. I draw this to your attention just because I know that obedience is important. I know that we all don't want to make God angry and, and do things that offend God. Yes, that's true. But what does obeying the gospel mean? Because the gospel is the good news. And if we listen and hear like Abraham and let the inside change, then the outside will follow. But what does obeying the gospel mean? Does it mean doing all these things? It can't be because many people went to Jesus and said, what must we do to work the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe. You see, don't substitute doing or works for believing. 
Believing is completely different. Believing is inside person hearing and turning to God and say, yes, I know who you are. And I know you're good. That's believing. Works. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Maybe God's going to be happy. Maybe God will heal me. Heal me. That's works. They're completely different. And so Romans 10, 16 says, they have not obe all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? And this is a quotation from Isaiah 53, 1, which we will talk about a little later. But this 53, 1 is about the crucifixion. It says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. And he will have no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. This is talking about Jesus. And he is a man despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. And here he comes. The chastisement for our peace was put upon him, and by his stripes were healed. Peace is shalom. We just did it earlier. So the chastisement, the beating, the punishment that brought us shalom, wholeness, completeness, welfare, balance, was because it was all inflicted on Jesus. Jesus was marred beyond any human recognition because every single curse imaginable fell on him when he took our sins and put it upon himself. All those curses fell on him. And that's why we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Because cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So just to conclude here, Isaiah 53, it says here, He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In the Hebrew, that word grief is koli. The next paragraph, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs. Again, it's koli. Why do I say this? It's because koli in Hebrew means disease. So Jesus was a man acquainted with disease. When? When was he sick? Never. Only on the cross when he took all of our curses. He was a man who bore our sicknesses, diseases. When? Only on the cross. I know your English translations use the word griefs. But if you look up any Hebrew interlinear, you'll see the word koli and you'll see the word disease. And just in case you're not convinced, Matthew 8, 17, quoting Isaiah 53, uh, talking about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, who said the following, quote, himself took our infirmities and bore our diseases. There it is, quoting Isaiah 53. So we have Jesus bearing our sicknesses and our diseases. As we hear this great good news, our inside person prospers because we know God is for us. And as we prosper inside, the outside starts to, to manifest what's inside and we prosper and we're in health. Everything comes into balance. And we have shalom. Okay. Shalom, everyone.